Hey everyone, I just watched the video back and I realize I misspoke quite a bit. I do not have time to edit it, but I do have time for this quick intro. So, for example, when I say units, I mean months, and when I say goths, I mean huns. So when you get to those parts, please ignore it and all of the ums that I do, because I do that way too much. Uh, without further ado, on to the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to a pickup video here. This will be for um, almost four months of pickups, and there's quite a bit to get through. I'm going to have to record this in multiple videos, um, in multiple parts. So each part I'll be recording days in between, so if anything looks different, that's why. Um, first, I'll start with non-gaming items, because I've got mostly games, um, so that'll be a part two. This will be books, movies, and music. So just as a fun aside, I was able to find this, which I, it was like 50 bucks. It's, it's dumb, but it is an official Halloween 3 mask um, that is one of my favorite movies. It's even got the silver shamrock uh, button on the back. Absolutely love the film. It came a little too late for Halloween, but I do plan on wearing this next year. Even though I don't go to Halloween parties and no one comes trick-or-treating here, I'm just going to wear it because it has to be worn. And my wife got a big mask of Sam from uh, Trick or Treat. Uh, speaking of which, let me let me show this. So I had a previous Halloween video where I showed all the movies I picked up and I was watching. Well, I got a few more movies in and um, I'll show those. But one of the films I showed was Halloween 3 which came in a steel book. Uh, you can't see it on camera, but there is a slice through the steel book. It's really thin. It looks, uh, it's obviously, obviously something that happened at the factory. Um, cause it's really, really thin, but it's uniform and it goes across the front of the case. So I emailed my, um, it was screen factory. Didn't hear back from them, but I saw on their Facebook, they said, we're really busy. Um, you know, sorry, we'll we'll get you when we can. Well, Shout Factory is the parent company, so I emailed Shout Factory and I said, "Look, it's a really thin line, but like right now, I can feel my finger go over it. Um, it's under the cellophane, so it happened at the factory. Can I get a replacement case? Um, if you don't do that, I understand because it's just a case. And within a day, someone said, "Hey, we got your order. Don't worry about it. It's in the mail." And they sent me another one. This is a not a replacement case. This is a replacement copy. It's still sealed. So for anyone watching this, if you want this one, the one, you, you won't be able to see it, I don't think. Can you? It's uh, right across here. Yeah, I think you can see it right here. It's that razor thin line. Now, it's very minor, but as I told my wife, uh, my threshold for damage is if I was in a store and I saw that, would I keep it or put it back on the shelf and get another one? Well, I would have put this back on the shelf. So I emailed them. Turned out good for me. I got two copies, but this is for anyone out there that would like this copy. Let me know on Facebook or on here and I'll have a random, you know, I'll just pick a name out of a hat or something, I guess. Uh, but this is a sealed copy of Halloween 3, Night of the Witch, the Steelbook edition from Scream Factory. Uh, I will leave it sealed for you. You'll just have that little bitty, um, like I said, it's a razor thin, so not a big deal if you're getting it free, but when you pay for it, you know, you want it to be as nice as possible. And that's only going to be the first of several giveaways in this video. Um, I have stuff piled up that I've been wanting to do a big giveaway video. I I'm just not going to get around to it, I don't think. So as I go along, I'll hold up something. I'll say, hey, if you want this, let me know. Moving on, um, this is the very first issue of Threads, the post-apocalyptic UK movie. I've talked about it before, but that's because my wife had bought me a region-free DVD player years ago, and I bought the, the British version. This is from Aero... no, Severin. This is the very first time it's been released in North America on a disc. This is a Blu-ray, and it just so happened maybe a week apart the first blu-ray release of the day after came out this is kind of our version of threads but um 
it's very tame in comparison. However, The Day After does star uh, some named actors at the time. Now, I don't know if most people on here would recognize them, but they were they were known actors at the time. So to see them kind of slowly uh, die from radiation poisoning was a big deal. But they're both movies about a nuclear strike. Threads is the much more riveting one. Uh, it's interspersed with little facts about what uh, how much fallout would be. Um, the damage caused, you know, by the sun being blocked from particles in the atmosphere, how long it would take to recover from that. The Day After is much more of a movie. Uh, it has a stronger narrative. Threads follows several different families and uh, what happens to them. Needless to say, like, everyone dies. But uh, that's not really a spoiler. The world pretty much ends as, like, a wasteland in Threads. They really go for it. The Day After follows one family. A lot of them die. But it's, um, like I said, tame in comparison, but because they were known actors, it was really surprising to see them die. I uh, waited about a week after Halloween, and this came back in stock for $20, or $20.95, and that was the Nightmare on Elm Street collection. It's one through seven. My wife's never seen any of these, and we made it through the first seven Jason films, Friday the uh, fr sorry, we made it through the first seven Friday the 13th. She didn't get to the 8th, and... I knew it would happen. As soon as Halloween was over, she didn't want to watch horror movies at all. My blissful period ended, but she had never seen Nightmare on Elm Street. And so I grabbed this collection, only 20 bucks. So super happy to get it. I can't wait to show her these next year. Um, this is one of my favorite shows. Uh, for some reason, my camera is messing up. It's having a hard time following my movements. I'm not sure what's going on here. This laptop is just getting old. Um, Criterion. There was a Criterion sale on Barnes & Noble for 50% off, so I double-checked on Amazon, and everything that was 4 to $10 cheaper, I picked up. Uh, I think this is quite on. This is a horror anthology, a black and white one, out of Japan. Uh, La Jeti, I believe is the name. And it is the inspiration for 12 Monkeys. It's a short black and white film. I've seen it before. I like it a lot. I've never seen the other one. Uh, people say it's kind of like this hypnotic travel log. Kind of how planet Earth, it's just images of things happening, but it's hypnotizing. Uh, that's what the second one's supposed to be. People really recommended it. Of course, there's Rashomon. Uh, this was, as far as I know, the first film that did uh, multiple perspectives of the same event. It's based on people's recollection of something happening, and they each give varying uh, versions of the same scenario. And a double pack of Yojimbo and Sanjuro, two awesome samurai films you can buy separately or in a set. Um, I have most of these on DVD. I never bought them on Blu-ray. But after getting a Blu-ray upgrade of a few series, uh, I can see that uh, the crispness is really nice. And... You wouldn't think there would be that much of an improvement with black and white, but there is. Especially if you view like the Twilight Zone on Blu-ray, it's super sharp. And Outer Limits came out recently on Blu-ray, and that looks really great too. Um, I did also get um, Harikari, but it was damaged, and this is why I will not buy from Barnes & Noble again. Despite the fact that it was damaged, I had to pay return shipping, so I lost about $4 in that. And that, man, that annoyed me. Um... They even say on their website, you know, it doesn't matter if it's damaged or you just want to return it. You have 14 days to send it back. And uh, if you have a store, though, you can go drop it off and they'll give you your money back. But I don't have a Barnes & Noble, Barnes and Noble near me, so I lost money on that. So, fuck you, Barnes & Noble. But kind of not because those were good deals. Uh, lastly, music. <clears throat> now, if you're from overseas, you have Datadisc in the UK. If you're from Australia, you have uh, Death Waltz. In the U.S., we have Mondo, and all these have come from Mondo. It's mostly music and movie soundtracks, and they're kind of like limited run in that they can sell out very quickly. It just depends on what the thing is, <clears throat> and they'll have a limited pressing. They'll offer maybe two or three variants of something, and they generally try to have one that's limited to, say, 1,000 or 500 or something. Um, Datadisc will have a variant, and we, we almost never get that one. So if you get the Datadisc variant, that one's even rarer than the rare Mondo one. But data just takes a while to ship to the U.S. And Mondo is their official distributor and they work together. So um, let me just get on with it because these three are my latest ones. They're still sealed. What's odd is I don't really like listening to the the specific games music while I'm playing. So I'll put on another games music while I play. I don't know. 
Only albums, though. I found that. The only soundtracks I like on disc are Deadly Premonition and the Near Games. Anything else, I, I will not play it. But you put the album on, and I'll let it run while I, I play a game. And I don't know why. It just It's better that way to me. So, Gradius. There's also Snatcher. And Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I missed out on Rondo of Blood. That one actually sold out really, really fast. Um, there's also, this is going to take a little bit of an explanation here. They had a deal where if you bought uh, five of the Halloween soundtracks, they sent you a free slipcase. Now, I was already going to buy Halloween 3. I mean, that's a given. That soundtrack is awesome. The movie's awesome. Um, and so I was going to buy the first one, too. So I said, okay, well, I have one, three, and if you bought four, you bought it in a, a combo pack with five in the slipcase. So I'm like, well, the, the only one really is, uh, let me listen to, to four. Really liked four soundtracks. They're all kind of the same variant uh, variations, except for three on the, the Carpenter's first one. And it was Halloween, and my wife was really into it, and you know, I got three in first, so we're playing that constantly. We're playing the It Follows soundtrack. So I went ahead... And I said, let me just get them all, because I started listening to four on YouTube, let her listen to it. She liked it a lot. So if you did that, you got the slip cover. So this is Halloween 1 through 5 on vinyl. Well, the problem is they initially sent me um, this one. And if you see here, let me get the dust off, it is bent. So I emailed them, and I said, uh, this was from Mondo. So I said, hey, uh, the slip cover is actually dented. You packed it well, but something happened. Maybe it was dropped before shipment. I don't know. And they have some... Whoever works their customer service account, the name's Roxy. Now, I'm not sure if that's just a catch-all name or if that's a one specific individual. I know for my work, I have a catch-all email account where I answer pe emails for other people because they just don't want to do it. So it's all sent from me. But if Roxy is an individual person, they are on their A game because I emailed them before. And within a few hours, you get a response. And sure enough, she sent me a thing saying... Your replacement slip, slip case is on the way. Sorry about that. So I got two of them. And in the other one, I put the other game soundtracks I bought, which are... Well, actually, one of these is a gift from a friend. Um, okay, now this is just the It Follows soundtrack, which is an absolute must for Halloween. I've had this for a while. I picked up the John Carpenter anthology for $12. Um, it's not the original songs. It's his work that he has slightly redone. Now, in the new movie, he worked on it, but largely his son and someone else worked on the new thing. But this is him kind of tweaking his old his old music, which some people were annoyed by, but since I have a lot of his original music, I don't mind. Uh, this was a gift from a friend years ago, Hellraiser. Uh, but the other two game soundtracks are Panzer Dragoon Saga, which is it's just as, like, uh, I don't know how to put it. It's It's still as good today as it was back then. Like, the whole series has great music. It's, it's very like orchestral, over the top. You really get into it. It makes you that, that sense of flight and freedom is really emphasized by the music. And this the soundtrack is fantastic. Um, and lastly, I was able to get Police Knots. I did find though that I like I really like half of the soundtrack, and I can do without the other half. Um, but the sound the the, the the half that I do like, I really enjoy, including that killer theme song, which people have in their YouTube videos as intros because it's just so catchy. Uh, so moving on to books, uh, someone on eBay sells magazine uh, protective covers, and I end up grabbing a few of those because I have had serious problems in the past with damage. Um, so I'll show you the covers. So they're resealable bags. And you can put multiple issues in each one. Like once I see, I'll put another game fan in here. So I'll have three game fans in one sealable protective case. Here's a PC gamer. And that's because of, I found this. So if you see, everything is gone here. The spine is gone. I'm trying to prevent this kind of damage on my other magazines. You see that? So, yeah, that was a huge blow. Uh, I'm going to have to toss a lot of these because uh, they basically just deteriorated the spine. Um, it's gone. It's not just that the, the, the 
image is gone, you can see here it's tearing. So the if there's physical damage. So I prefer the earlier PC gamers anyway. Uh, all I for my magazines, I want 1990 to about 96, and then I, I'm good. I don't need the rest. Uh, late 90s gaming was okay, but by then the Saturn was gone, the 3DO was gone, the, the Jaguar is gone. If they weren't gone, they were effectively gone. Like I know the Saturn had a few more releases, but I'll, you know I'll push it to 97, 98. You know, 97, 98 mm, depends on the magazine. I would like them. Uh, but especially 94 to like 97, that's when you had seven or eight consoles on the market. And it was really booming. It's a lot of fun. PC gaming was starting to pick up with the introduction of CD, cheaper CD-ROM units. There's a whole multimedia revolution. So this isn't a big loss to me. I mean, it's annoying. This was from 2000. And December and July of 2000, um, this was an awesome demo disc, though. They gave you 12 games on one disc for free. This is before, like, Abandonware was really a thing. So to get 12 games for free um, was, I mean, I, that disc used to go for, like, 30-something dollars on eBay. Because it was, the unless you use eBay in the early 2000s, it was the only way to get them. Uh, yeah, it included Wing Commander, uh, XCOM... The full versions of all of them, Ultima Underworld, uh, I still have the ooh, Ultima One, I still have the disc in the back. It was it was fantastic. But um, uh, up next are the books. So let me grab those. Hey everyone, it's another day, and now it's time for the book portion of the pickups. Not too many here. Um, this will definitely have to be separated from games, though, because I've accumulated quite a bit. I've put everything in a pile, and it's massive. Uh, only came from a few sources, but I'll talk more about those whenever I, uh, I get to the games. So there's just a few books here. Uh, if you see my cat, just ignore her. She's been walking in and out. Uh, but the first one here is one of the most interesting reads I've come across, and I can't believe it's not talked about more, and that is Manpower Shortage and the Fall of the Roman Empire in the West. Now, I read two books, but they're e-books, so I'm not going to show them. One was on Stilicho, and one was on Aetius. Stilicho is famous for his relationship with Alaric, who sacked Rome. And Aetius was famous for his relationship with the Goths and Attila. And he defeated Attila with a, an ally, a Germanic alliance. Um, and in that book, it referenced this one. Uh, this is only $35. Oh, there she is. And I'm not sure why it's not talked about more. I've looked up to see if uh, this work's been superseded or somehow proven wrong, and I have not come across anything. And this tells a very dramatic um, story about the West. Basically, uh, it's like a house with weak wood, you know, like termite damage and rot. Um, the author, this was originally written in the 30s, and Michigan Press reprinted it. Uh, I think it's an essential read if you're into that era. And the period, and to understand what was going on or why Rome was giving barbarians land, uh, essentially because that land was abandoned. Um, he goes through the laws of Majorian, uh, Theodora, uh, Theodosius, and others to show that at one point in Africa, which was one of the most stable and prosperous eras uh, areas of the Western Empire, up to seventy five percent of the emperor's own lands were being uh, were not being farmed, which is dramatic because you know. If lands were going to be farmed, it would be imperial lands. And talking about how the cities had shrunk in Gaul to their pre-Roman size. So the town size were in, say, Caesar saw it. You know, during the Principate, it expanded and it constricted back to those to that original size. And they can tell that by seeing wall foundations and when they were built and how there's a sediment layer under it of a city that was built. Okay, my cat's going to be a jerk about this. But yeah, this is essential reading. Um, stop it. And one of the best books of the period uh, goes into a lot of detail about just how short um, of manpower, what that does in terms of economics, um, in terms of the military, why the, the Western field armies were smaller in that era. Because um, he goes into detail, if you think about it, a lot of their centurions, uh, which are, you know, the middle commanders and some of their higher commanders led from the front they died he estimates it takes six units to form a field army and up to two years to properly train it 
uh, they don't have that kind of time. That's why they rely on moral mercenaries. But every time they did that, they're taking away more of their population. Because um, in theory, whenever the empire was restricted to Italy, they should have had the same chance to explode as the Republic did. Uh, but the difference is they did not have the manpower for it. Uh, Hannibal, when they were able to replace tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of soldiers during the Punic Wars, they were no longer able to do that. You also had the uh, aristocracy in Italy who were not willing to give up their farmers because at this point, uh, and the book goes into this as well, uh, it's hereditary. Your jobs are hereditary. That was enacted by Diocletian. So if your dad was a farmer, you were a farmer. Uh, they had a big problem with people trying to leave their positions. So someone in the city who was, say, middle class, they could not afford the taxes because if they couldn't collect enough, they had to fund it from themselves. So they would try to go to work the fields while someone in the fields would try to escape to the city. And there was basically a manpower shortage all around for every industry. And there's law after law compelling people to go back to their original stations because everything was uh, mandated. If you if your dad dyed cloths, if he made robes, everything, you had to do that. So really goes into detail how it stagnated, how it declined, um, why so much land was given away to the Germanic tribes. And to that end, there's also Romans and Barbarians, the decline of the Western Empire. I just bought this. Um, I've been trying to get the stickers off. It came in yesterday. They put th something this size, but I mean, even bigger on the front. I don't know why. Um, this talks more about how they influence one another in the border areas. Um, there are some people that think the migrations were a seamless transition. They were not, and archaeology proves that. But it also wasn't relentless hordes. Um, you know, I guess a good example is like Texas. There's you go in some parts of Texas and there's heavy Spanish speaking population. Well, there's going to be some some uh, merging of populations in Europe as well with the, uh, the various Germanic tribes. That goes into that. Like I said, I don't know too much more detail, only what I've read about the blurb. And it was a referenced book, so I definitely wanted to get it. Uh, one I did read was Generalissimos of the Western Roman Empire. At one point, this book was $200. I thought I was making that up because I found this one for 25 used. And it turns out that no, one of the one of the reviews mentions that the book is 200 bucks. Last time I checked, they still had a $45 copy up. I did, however, bend it, which, which, ah, uh, because this was at a high school in Aurora, Colorado. Came in mint condition, and I'm the one that bent it. So, goes back to my days when I was a kid collecting comic books. Like, when, when I see a bend in something, it drives me nuts. Uh, this is a great compliment to the Manpower Shortage book and the book on Aetius and Stilico. It referenced this book heavily with good reason because they take quite a bit from this book. Uh, but this one also talks about Odokar, who was one of the last uh, Generalissimos. And who is it? It's Constant Constantine the Third. He's a Constantine, but uh, not you know not the great. There it, go over, it goes over Stilico. Uh, let's see, da, da, da. Constantius, uh, then Aetius, and then Odokar, and towards the end of the empire. And essentially, he just come up. He didn't create the term generalissimo. He's using it in this context because there was a position in the West that did not exist in the East. In the East, you had five generals who were of the same standing. In the West, you had two. And depending on who was more influential, one was the senior and one was the junior, which allowed one person to call all the shots. And they had several puppet emperors in the West. Or in the East, the emperors were able to reestablish themselves with Martian pretty early on and uh, take a, a lead role in the military. Didn't happen in the West. And it shows that aside from Constantius, most of the generals were happy to let someone else be the emperor while they themselves had the true power. Also talked about an interesting theory that Reisimer, uh, he was uh, the, a full, what we say, barbarian. Uh, Stilicho was half Vandal, half Roman. Aetius was Roman. Um, Constantius was... Roman and something else, maybe full Roman. He was from Britain. and uh, But Reisimer was full-on barbarian. He was a friend of Majorian and ended up killing the emperor Majorian, who had one of the last successful runs for an emperor in terms of leading the military. How Reisimer viewed the empire more as a federacy with the various Germanic kingdoms uh, not being directly controlled by the emperor, but safeguarding Italy and the emperor as a center of cult of, uh, of civilization 
and um, just it being a beacon head and them protecting it, learning from it and the exchange being, you know, they defend Italy and the emperor and through it, they get uh, culture and civilization. Uh, that was, that's a really interesting theory. And Reisimer, he put it as if someone was a part of the former British empire, are they eager to see it reestablished? You know, no, neither would Reisimer, but they do appreciate what that could, uh, the benefits of associating, associating with it could be. And lastly, I picked up the Seleucid and Hasmonean periods in the apocalyptic worldview. Um, I've read about this. It's like the Maccabee Revolution from the Seleucid uh, uh, point of view. And I now that you can read it through a Jewish point of view, this is a series of lectures. Um, I have not read it yet. It's a pretty recent release, actually. Um, and it's interesting because from the Seleucid point of view, uh, Judea is just kind of this semi-backwater area. You know, eh, well... There's an uprising there periodically. It's annoying, but they deal with it. But, you know, the Maccabean uh, revolt is seen as like this massive deal. It's hugely important, influential. Like this, several people argue they viewed it like this was the end time struggle. Where from the Seleucid point of view, they have an empire that's absolutely massive. And they're just kind of going, nah, send a general. Well, to them, it was, you know... Like it says, apocalyptic. And uh, the Maccabeans were, were pretty rough. Uh, so if you were Jewish and you lived in a town and some Seleucid authorities came, put a statue up to Zeus, and you just ignored it because why would you care? They don't make you worship it or anything. Uh, you would probably be killed by the Maccabean uh, group, their army, because they were very, I guess the word's like zealous. They wanted a strict adherence to Judaism. If there was any slack, they were going to come down hard on you. And it went on for quite a while. The Seleucids were dealing with a whole lot of other problems during this period. Um, the Judeans also had a, a, I think it's Joshua, was really adept at taking advantage of Seleucid weakness. Like when they fought the Ptole Ptolemaic Egypt, he would always get more and more concessions out of them until he established his own kingdom. And so this covers all that. And it's just an interesting to see the perspectives from a different point of view. Like I said, the rest of the books I bought were digital. I bought one on Harlan Ellison's uh, short stories. It was like 99 cents. They had a bunch of Black Friday deals. Um, but I won't talk about those. I'm reading an, a science fiction anthology I've had for years. Um, and I'll talk about that when I do a end of year book talk. But that's it for now. Look for the game video coming soon. It's quite a bit. I got some really cool hardware stuff, one of which I've, I waited a year to get in and I got it in. It works great. Um, as in I paid for it a year ago and it just got here. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to showing that stuff because it's been a lot of fun. I, I want to record a little more footage. I won't have a lot of gameplay footage, but I will have some more but mostly for the hardware side. That's it, everyone. Look for that in a couple days, and I will talk to everyone later.